Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name's Claire and this is Yoli. I make videos all about houseplant care, sharing tips and tricks I've learned over the years to help keep your plants happy and healthy. And today I'm finally going to be harvesting my Anthurium clarinervium berries. I've waited such a long time to be able to do this and I'm very, very excited. So yeah, I'm gonna do that and I'm also just gonna recap how to cross-pollinate Anthuriums for anybody that isn't sure and also answer some of your questions on it. So yes, I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. So I know I have gone through how to pollinate before and I don't currently have two anthuriums with inflorescences at the moment to demonstrate it so I will pop that clip in in case you missed it. And I know I've been saying for absolutely ages that I would talk about how you get the seeds for anthuriums to grow them from seed so I thought I would quickly go through that. I've got two of my clarinerviums here. So I did actually take a video of when I pollinated these ones recently, so I will show you that in a minute, but I'll very briefly explain. So you obviously need to wait for these things here to pop up, which are inflorescences, and I've actually got another one already coming up Ooh. on this plant just, oh, you can kind of see it just there. That's a new one coming up. Um, but once they produce an inflorescence, they'll basically start in the female stage and that's when you'll be able to see kind of droplets of sap, it's called stigmatic fluid, and that will be covering the spadex here, which is this bit. And that is when they are receptive and that's when you can pollinate them. But if you don't have pollen to pollinate them, then unfortunately you're going to have to wait and probably store the pollen unless you've got two active plants, which luckily I did this time. I've never been that lucky before. But they usually stay in this female receptive stage from anywhere from about four days to a week in my experience. And as I say, if you've got pollen or you're able to pollinate them at that point, then that is great. But if you don't, after they've been in the female stage, you'll notice the stigmatic fluid won't be being produced anymore and instead it will be producing pollen and that is if you want to pollinate in the future what you should collect. I've actually got some that I collected in tinfoil just here and again I'll insert a clip of how I did that but if you do have two that are one in the female stage one in the male stage at the same time then you can essentially take the pollen from one transfer it onto the other and hopefully in a few months time you will start to get some nice berries which you can then pick and plant and turn into new little anthuriums. It was really, really annoying with my ones. So basically you want to choose quite a mature plant on the whole because you want it to have a good energy reserves because producing berries does take a lot of energy in the plants. And this one obviously is quite big and this would have been the perfect one to pollinate. But annoyingly, and I've taken a risk here, this is the one that was in the female stage at the time that this one was in the male stage. So I could have just collected the pollen from both of them and saved it, but I took the risk and I have pollinated this plant and it's only actually got three leaves at the moment. So I could risk doing some serious damage to this plant, but it was kind of more like a trial and error thing. I don't know if it's gonna work. I did the pollination, I think about three, four weeks ago now, and I'm kind of kidding myself that I can see bulging already. I think it's too soon to tell, but I'll keep you updated with these. And as I say, I'll pop a clip in of me pollinating them to show you exactly how it's done in case I didn't explain that well enough. One thing that I forgot to mention in that clip is that if you do decide to store your pollen in the freezer, oh, hello Yoli. <laughs> if you do decide to store it in the freezer, it's a really good idea to get some of these silicon gel things to pop in with them, just because any moisture that gets in there can destroy the pollen and mean that it's not usable. And that has happened to me before. Sometimes even if you seal the bag really, really well, moisture will still get in. So yeah, I just pop a few of these into the sandwich bag or into the Tupperware pot, whatever you're using. And it just helps to stop that from happening. But so the anthurium that you saw in that clip that I just pollinated, that was, I think about eight and a half, nine months ago. This is her now. And as you can tell, the berries are beautiful and ripe and they are ready to be harvested. And I was a little bit worried, as I said in that clip, I was a little bit worried about this plant because she hasn't got, I mean, she's she is a very well-established plant, but if you compare her to the one behind me here, for example, she hasn't maybe got the greatest energy reserves because she's not quite so big but it did work. So yeah, I'm I'm very excited to do that. And I'm just gonna walk you through what I'm gonna be doing and then I'll get onto your questions. I'm gonna basically do a little experiment. So before, whenever I've harvested berries or grown anthuriums from seed, I've usually used moss to propagate. 
and I am going to be doing some in moss but I'm also going to be doing some in perlite and I'm also going to try some in soil because I've never done that before and then I'm also going to try some just in damp kitchen roll like that and the reason I've got two tubs here is because I'm going to just keep that one in the same conditions as these ones probably fairly close to a window somewhere fairly light fairly warm and this one I'm gonna I don't know if this is gonna work but I know that seed germination can take place in the dark and they don't actually need that much light so I'm gonna essentially do what I do to propagate things like avocados and mango stones where I also use damp kitchen roll and I'm gonna actually keep this one in the dark and I'm, ju I'm just gonna monitor them I'm gonna see what works best because I'm really interested to know I know some of the seeds that I've tried to sprout before have not germinated so it would be interesting to find out the most effective methods so yeah, I will update you on those when when the time comes when they start doing something. But the way that I'm going to do it, these ones, so these ones were actually probably at their prime yesterday. They were really, really plump and firm. And I thought about harvesting them then, but I was like, I'll just give them one more day to see how they do. And they're getting just a little bit squidgy today. So I think they should be very easy to pick, I hope. Um, I'm actually just going to try. I'm just going to try one. So I'm literally just going to put a little bit of pressure on the side and in theory yay okay so that's one that's just popped out and so you want to remove the the kind of squishy berry bit around them just because that can make them more prone to rotting so I'm just going to literally pick that off and there should be you can get a few seeds per berry but yeah as I start to peel it away you can see the little seed inside um, by the looks of it there's just one in here but then I've just got a bowl of lukewarm water and I'm just going to give them a wash to make sure that all of the berry is, is properly off them. So yeah, oh, I don't know if you'll be able to see, but that is, that is the first little seed. So I'm just going to give it a little rinse. And I don't actually know how many I'll have in here. Obviously, there are a lot and there could potentially be, as I say, more than one per berry. So I'm just going to start with these ones and then I'll, I'll make a little moss propagation box as well. These are also just little hummus tubs that I'm using. So once I've done that, I'll be able to just pop the lid on them. They'll have a really nice little humid environment to germinate in. And fingers crossed, I should have some beautiful Amphilarium clarinervium berries soon. And so the top of the seed is the slightly thinner part and the base is slightly wider and the base is where the root's gonna sprout from. So although you can just kind of lay them on top of the substrate, I'm just gonna poke them down into it a little bit. I'll put some clips in. But the first question was, how long does it take for the seeds to form? So I've, I've only actually ever had experience pollinating Anthurium clarinervium. I haven't yet created any hybrid plants. And I've heard that it can really, really vary. So for me, these ones, as I say, took about eight and a half, nine months, which I think from what I hear for Anthurium clarinervium is actually quite quick. They can take anywhere from about seven months up until about a year and a half, which is obviously a very long time to wait. And if you watched my houseplant tour recently, I showed you the berries in that, and that was only a week and a half ago, and they were still completely green. And I was like, they're taking ages, nothing's happening. And then literally overnight, they started going this beautiful orangey ripe colour and it just happened so, so quickly. A lot quicker than I was expecting it to. I kind of thought they'd, they'd turn quite gradually. Oh, there's actually two seeds in this berry, so that's exciting. And the soil mix that I'm using for the ones that I'm trialling in soil, I'm, I'm not quite sure about the soil method. I know in theory it should work, but propagating in soil sometimes scares me. But I'm just using what I use for kind of like a standard anthurium mix. This is just soil ninja's base mix mixed with some worm castings and lots of bark. So it looks like that. And again, I've just I've made the soil slightly damp. And when I close the lid, the moisture should just contain itself. And I hope it works, but I will let you know. And the ones that I'm doing in kitchen roll, because I am just going to actually fold the kitchen roll over them afterwards, it doesn't really matter what way up they are, you just literally want to sit them on the kitchen roll like that. Also, some of these berries are much bigger than others, like I've got some very small ones down here, so I'm going to just try and do a really, a really even mix of big and small in each so that I can get a better overview of what works best. Oh, I was also going to make a little moss propagation box. I'm just using a takeaway Tupperware pot, which is so great for propagation. And yeah, I'm just going to line the bottom with moss, keep that hydrated, just give it a little spritz before I close the lid. But again, once the lid's closed, assuming it is completely airtight, it's going to stay, it's going to stay fairly moist. So 
yeah, that is what that one's looking like. And this is how, as I say, this is how I've done it in the past and I have had success doing it this way. So this is the method that I'm feeling very confident about. It's just the other ones that are a little bit, I don't know, I'm just, I'm figuring those ones out, but I thought seeing as I've got so many seeds, I may as well give it a go and then I can let you know what works best. And the next question is, how do you know if pollination has been successful? Um, so, I mean, it's kind of just a waiting game. I've had some anthuriums that I've attempted to pollinate in the past and it hasn't worked. I think once you've done the pollination process, continue to, if you, if you do have pollen, continue to pollinate every single day whilst it's still in the female stage. I, I think I did that with this one. I think although I showed you the initial pollination, I did go back with more pollen and just kind of gave it another dusting just to make sure that it would take. And then I, I did actually, I've got a photo, so I'll pop that photo in. I compared it to another inflorescence that wasn't successful. And I think the main thing that you'll notice is that it doesn't die off in the same way as other inflorescences would. Like if they haven't been successfully pollinated, often they'll kind of stick around for a few weeks, sometimes a month, and then they'll start to yellow and they'll, they'll naturally die back. And if your pollination has been successful, it will keep going and it won't die back. And then it's just a waiting game. Like with this one, I started to very subtly notice it bulging after a couple of months and the bulging just slowly got more and more and more until I could start to see berry shapes appearing. And I I mean, it is, you do have to have a lot of patience for this process because as I say, it's definitely not something that's gonna happen overnight. But the other thing that I noticed with this one, and again, if I've got pictures of anything that I'm talking about, because I did take quite a lot of pictures of this process, I'll, I'll pop them on the screen, but I also noticed the base of it started to become a lot greener. And you know, sometimes if, if they are dying off, they'll kind of, they'll start to, as I say, go a bit yellow and kind of shrivel up a bit. This one just got plumper and plumper and looked more and more alive. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how you tell whether or not it's worked. But if you're in any doubt at all and you have tried to pollinate and the inflorescence hasn't died back, just leave it there because it might just be really slow to get going and you could chop it back and then you could find that actually it has worked and you're just disrupting that and ruining your chances of getting some lovely berries. So yeah. One of you asked, what are F1 hybrid seeds? Oh my goodness, okay, I just wanna clarify, I'm definitely not an expert on anthurium pollination. I only know what I know from doing it and the research that I've done on it. My understanding of F1 hybrid seeds, there is a Latin term for this and I'll put it on the screen because I can't remember what it's called, but it essentially translates, I think, to first child and they're basically the seeds produced where you take two different parent plants, like two different types of anthuriums and you cross pollinate them and therefore the baby won't have identical genes to either parent. I'm pretty certain that's what it is. And also I know with cross pollinated anthuriums where it's not like, for example, like pure clarinervium like I've got here, those seeds do tend to be a lot more, they produce plants that are a lot more resilient, a lot less prone to health issues which is kind of like, <laughs> okay, no, I won't give that example on my channel. Um, it's kind of like when you think of like a mixed breed dog as opposed to a purebred dog. A lot of the time, a purebred animal will be a lot more prone to certain issues as opposed to one that's that's been crossbred, if that makes sense. Um, and I know, where is it? There was also a question on, uh, can all theriums be hybridized slash cross-pollinated? Is there an easy way to figure it out? So again, this is something I just want to clarify again, I'm not an expert. This is something that I have done a lot of research on, but there's not a huge amount of data. I think the the most, the best thing that you can do at the moment, there's not an easy way to figure it out, is just look at hybrids that already exist. And if you're in any doubt, try to cross pollinate in that way because you know it's possible. But it does come down to, I think the chromosome counts of the plant and also the origins of the plant. So for example, if one type of anthurium is native to Colombia and another one's native to Mexico, potentially they might not be able to be cross-pollinated. Like for example, you don't actually see that many anthurium clarinervium hybrids. And obviously they are probably, probably like the most popular rare anthurium available. And I've seen, I've seen clarinervium cross pterodactyl hybrids before, which look amazing, by the way, you should go and Google that because they look insane. But I think there just hasn't been enough research done at the moment. I know there are lots of studies going on, but I mean, they're mainly things like what you and I are doing, like trial and error and seeing, seeing how things work that way. So no is the short answer. There's not a quick and simple way to figure out whether or not it will work. It is just 
it is just trial and error. I'll put some links down below as well to articles that I've read that are very useful, as well as some people, oh my goodness, I follow a couple of people on Instagram that are like pros at anthurium pollination and they're constantly growing things from berries. So I'll put their details down below and if you want to go looking for answers or you want to comment them down below, please do, that would be very useful. But yeah, they would probably be better people to ask just because they've done so much of it. And I would say I'm still relatively new to it. I'm still, I'm still learning a lot about this. Again, if any of you know, if any of you have done this a lot and you know more about this, then please do share, please do share information down below in the comments because I would like to learn and I'm sure a lot of people watching this video as well would also like to learn. So yeah, I would be very grateful for that. This is an incredibly satisfying feeling, peeling them out of the berry. <laughs> It just makes me so proud as well to think that this plant has been able to do this. It, I mean, nature is just, oh, the, wow, that one came up very easily. Nature is just magic, isn't it? It's absolutely amazing. And it's crazy as well to think that if I hadn't pollinated, then this wouldn't have happened. Oh, which actually makes me think of another question that I saw. Um, can cross-pollination happen naturally? So yeah, I mean, obviously in the wild, it does happen naturally. I think usually, I mean, bugs, beetles, ants, stuff like that will go from one plant to the other and they'll carry pollen with them and they will help to cross-pollinate plants. In a home environment, I think on the whole, it's very unlikely that cross-pollination will happen naturally, unless you do have one anthurium that sprouts two inflorescences that are very close to each other and they just happen to rub up against each other at the right time. I think, yeah, in a home environment, because obviously a lot of the factors like bugs, like winds, like animals, all that sort of stuff aren't in play in the same way as they would be if it was in its natural environment. So if you want your anthuriums to produce berries, I wouldn't rely on it just happening. I think you do, you do have to get involved. I have got the tiniest little seed here. I don't know if that one will do anything. I might pop that one into the moss actually. But yeah, there's a very high chance that some of these seeds might not take. As I say, I have done it before and I've had some that have been successful and others that just haven't done anything. The germination process with the seeds as well, obviously that's why I'm trying to figure out what works best and what's gonna be the fastest and most effective way, but it really does vary. The ones that I had in sphagnum moss last time, some of them I noticed start to split and root very, very quickly, as in within a matter of weeks, and others took months and months and months. And some grew into kind of plants about that size in the time it took others to literally just produce the tiniest root. So I don't think there's like an exact time scale that you can put on these things, but we'll see if any of these work better. And the last time that I grew anthurium from seed, it was actually, they were some seeds that I got from someone on a Facebook group and she only knew what the mother plant was. She only knew that it was part clarinervium and she'd got the pollen from someone else. So I don't think she knew whether or not they were hybrid plants. And oh my goodness, I was so impatient. As soon as they started to form little plants, I was like, oh my goodness, what is it? Like, what kind of hybrid could this be? And I was asking so many people if they had any theories and realistically, until it starts to produce bigger, kind of slightly more mature growth, it is pretty much impossible to tell the majority of the time. I mean, the majority of the time, obviously, if they're kind of like round leaf anthuriums like that, they are gonna look very similar as babies. So again, as with all of this, it is just kind of a waiting game to figure out if you have cross-pollinated what, what type of anthurium they're gonna be. Oh, when you pop a big one out like that and it comes out perfectly, it is the most satisfying thing. They're almost like little popcorn kernels. <laughs> wow, and there's two really quite big seeds in this one. At that you can see them in there. One of you asked what the difference is between a male and female flower so I kind of answered this in the clip that I put in before but when an inflorescence is produced and it would be so much easier if it was to work the other way around but it will start in the female stage and that's when it's receptive and that's when you can pollinate and obviously if you don't have the pollen to be able to pollinate at that point then there's not a lot you can do. You just kind of have to let it go to the male stage and then you'll be able to collect the pollen. But yeah, essentially inflorescences are androgynous. They switch from female to male and it's not ever going to be just one or the other. Like you're not going to suddenly just get a female one or suddenly get a male one. They do go through both stages. And the good thing as well with anthurium pollen is that if you, oh, that's a weird seed. That one's kind of translucent. If I put it next to that one, you'll be able to tell. Do you see what I mean? 
Ooh, yeah, in fact, that one just literally popped my fingers. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna attempt to do that one. But what I was gonna say is the good thing with anthurium pollen is that it does store quite well if you do it right. Like for example, philodendron pollen can only store for about a week max, even if you do everything, everything the same. But with anthurium pollen, I've managed to keep it for months and months and months. So if for example, you only have one anthurium plant and it gives you an inflorescence and you think, oh, I, I can't do it this time. I want to keep the pollen. If you preserve it in the right way, then you are still gonna be able to use it months down the line. And yeah, as I say, there's no, no rule about pollinating, no rule. <laughs> there's no reason you can't pollinate from one plant. So for example, one might give you, like this plant might give me another inflorescence and then I might be able to cross pollinate directly from that plant. So it doesn't mean that you need to go out and buy loads and loads of anthuriums. It's perfectly possible to do this with literally just one plant. With some of these tiny, tiny seeds, I'm actually gonna just put them to one side and I might create a different propagation box for them just because I think they're slightly less likely, it doesn't mean it's impossible, but they're slightly less likely to root and produce plants. So that means that they could run the risk of rotting more. So I'd quite like to keep the potential of that away from the other plants because obviously rot can spread very easily. So I'm thinking I might just do another moss propagation box similar to this one and then pop them in there. And who knows, maybe it will work. I was gonna say, I'm gonna have, assuming a lot of these take, I'm gonna have a lot of little anthurium clarinervium babies. So um, I'm not gonna be selling any of them yet, but if you guys are on Instagram, keep an eye on my Instagram stories over, over the coming months, and I might list some of them on there at some point, because don't get me wrong, I love anthurium clarinerviums, but even for me, I think, how many, I mean, how many seeds have I got here? I reckon I've probably got 60 plants or something like that. And yeah, I just don't think I need that many. <laughs> Someone said pollination isn't working. Any tips? Um, so as I've already said, it is really quite common for pollination not to work. Sometimes it does take a few tries. I've already spoken about reapplying the pollen, even if you think it's been successful the first time, so long as it's in the female stage, keep whacking the pollen on there every single day, covering all of the inflorescence. And obviously that's gonna help. Um, obviously just making sure, making sure firstly that the mother plant that you're pollinating is healthy and strong. That's why I was a little bit worried about this one because I think she only had two or three leaves at the time and I was like, oh God, do I risk, do I run the risk of actually killing the mother plant by doing this? Because it obviously takes a lot of energy from the plant. But once you've done it, in order to ensure that pollination is successful and your plant is going to be able to produce berries, I think the most important things are just to keep the plant in, in its optimum conditions. This one here hasn't been getting a lot of natural light, but I've had it next to my mother grow lights and that's done really good things for it. Keeping the humidity high, obviously staying on top of watering and monitoring that, making sure it's got all the right nutrients it needs. Just basically caring for your plant in the best possible way and replicating its natural environment as much as you possibly can because obviously that's just going to stand the plant in much better stead for being able to produce the berries because as I say it is I mean it's a big thing it's like it's like a it's like a woman having a baby <laughs> it's something that does require a lot of energy and if you think about like, okay, let's let's take the baby example. When, when a person is having a baby, their bodies are just gonna require, as I say, more nutrients and all of the stuff they need in order to not only feed the main body of the plant or the person, but they are gonna also need a little bit extra to be able to feed the babies as well. So yeah, I've fertilized this plant. I've spoken about it before. I'm using liquid gold leaf fertilizer, which I will link down below, but I've been fertilizing this plant pretty much every single time I've watered it since I pollinated it, just to make sure it's got all the nutrients, it's got all of the good things. Also making sure that your plant is potted in a really good quality soil as well. I use Soil Ninja and I think it's amazing. I've literally, I think for that plant, I've used pretty much the same mix as I'm using here and that seems to keep my anthuriums really happy. And then also it obviously depends on the time of year and you can absolutely pollinate all year round but again if you're not able to replicate its optimum growing conditions that makes it much less likely to be successful. When was nine months ago? How long ago was that? Yeah, so April, May time, so kind of late spring, early summer I, I pollinated this one and Again, I think that's because at that time, inflorescences do tend to pop up a lot more because the plant is in the stage where it would like to be pollinated. But if you are able to create an environment in your home that can essentially replicate summer conditions, then there's no reason at all that that couldn't work. Like, for example, if I have my anthuriums in my cabinet here and they started giving me inflorescences, 
even if it was the midst of winter, I would probably feel fairly secure pollinating them because they've got amazing lights, they've got amazing humidity, they've got everything that they would have in summertime in their natural environment, if that makes sense. And the other thing as well that I did, and I actually don't know the science behind this, I don't know if this is the right or wrong thing, but it did seem to work, is I made sure that although I had my grow lights on this plant, I made sure that the berries were really quite close to the grow lights, so they were also getting they were also getting lots of light. And I know that the this little bit here, this is actually just like a type of leaf. So I assume that is able to absorb light and photosynthesize in the same way as the rest of the plant. I could be wrong about that, but it seemed to work. So yeah, I would say make sure that your berries or your inflorescence in fructescence, whatever it is, isn't sat in a dark space. Will the berries grow back after you've harvested them? Oh my goodness, that would be great, wouldn't it? Um, no, very sadly, once you've once you've taken the berries off, as you can see on this section here that I'm working with, I've just picked the ones out of that, this section will completely die off. So that's why it's also important to harvest the berries quite soon, because once they get to their point of kind of peak ripeness, then they will start to, they'll start to naturally drop. And if you don't harvest them, then they run the risk of rotting as that section dies off. So if I wanted to do this again, sadly, it would be the case of waiting a very long time and doing the pollination process all over again from scratch. But God, yeah, that would be wonderful if the berries just kept growing back and you had an unlimited supply of clarinerviums. And as with any seed germination, once you've got them into the prop boxes or however you're choosing to germinate the seeds, it's a really good idea to just, apart from obviously making sure that the substrate stays hydrated, it's a really good idea just to leave them alone and not fuss with them too much. I know it's really, really tempting as you see things start to sprout to kind of want to have a look at its little root system, but until it is just a little bit established, you do run the risk of, of damaging the seed more and therefore it being unsuccessful. So what I'm going to do is I will obviously be checking up on them so that I can give you guys updates on what's working best. But I'm probably just going to close the lids on all of these, put them in the spots that I want to keep them, make sure they stay really warm. Warmth is the main thing. It helps with seed germination so, so, so much. And then just not really do much to them apart from just checking and having a look through the lids. I'm just going to try and be very patient and hope that by doing that it means that I'm going to have the most success possible and hopefully get loads of beautiful babies out of these ones. One of you asked, is the process the same with alocasia and philodendron pollination? Um, so in theory, yes it is. I have never successfully pollinated either. So with alocasia, the only time I've tried to pollinate alocasia was with my black velvet, my alocasia black velvet. and. Oh, I didn't, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing. And essentially, because it wasn't a very mature plant, it took up so much of that plant's energy that the actual mother plant ended up dying off and I lost the plant. So again, that's why I was a little bit wary about pollinating this plant that wasn't that mature. And with philodendron pollination, this is something that I am really excited to explore more this year. I've got several philodendrons in flower at the moment, and it's a little bit, I mean, is it trickier? So with with philodendron pollination, what basically happens is you'll start to see the flower being produced. If you are on my Instagram, you'll see that my philodendron code 69686 opened its flower the other day and oh my goodness, it's beautiful. But the window in which you can pollinate is very, very small because the flowers only actually open for, I think about 12 hours, sometimes a little bit longer, but they open and they'll close back up. And once they've closed back up, then they will go into the male stage and then you can collect the pollen, but it doesn't store very well in the same way as anthurium pollen. I think you can only really store it for about a week. So if you don't have another philodendron in flower in that time that you can pollinate, then you kind of just have to, it's kind of just more of a luck thing in terms of timing it right. So I think that's kind of why I haven't given it a go so far. I'm also just so wary about, again, the energy that it takes and the fact that most of my philodendrons that are flowering are ones like my white princess, my pink princess, and they're plants that I just am like, I'm not willing to take the risk for, for the sake of some berries. So I haven't done that as of yet. Potentially, as I say, I might try it come summertime, but at the moment I have actually just been chopping the flowers back because, because yeah, it's a risk that I'm not willing to take. But I do, I do find philodendron pollination absolutely fascinating because as I say, it's got a very short window in which the flower actually opens. And during that time, the base of it will get really, really warm. And I think I've spoken about this in a video already, but I'm gonna say it again because 
I just find it so interesting. Um, so the reason that that happens is because in its natural habitat, what that does is it signals to bugs and beetles that can see detect inflorescence that that is that is the flower they need to go to, and so they'll go there. Quite often, the flower will close again around them. I think sometimes they mate in there as well, and that can be a form of pollinating. But as the flower opens again, they'll fly off carrying the pollen, and the cycle continues. They'll go on to the next flower, and that is how pollination naturally happens. So again, I mean in terms of like self-pollination in a home environment with philodendron, from what I know about it, it would be pretty much impossible, pretty much impossible. So again, kind of manual hand pollination is needed there. But I know a lot of people that have had success with it and it's definitely something that I would love to do. It's just the risk element that just frightens me a little bit because I love the mother plants more than anything in the world and the thought of potentially doing something that might, I don't know, that might kill them just makes me go, is it worth it? Or should I just appreciate what the plant's doing and not kind of tamper with it too much? So yeah, one day, but not, not just yet. I was also going to say it might be an idea, especially if you've got sensitive skin, to wear gloves whilst doing this because I, I have noticed whilst I've been doing this and kind of picking the berries off, I've got quite itchy and I just touched my face and now my face is itching so I didn't think of that and I've never dealt with this many berries in one go before. I was going to say I've never had an issue usually but I would probably recommend wearing gloves. In fact, I might actually go and just like wash my hands and stuff. But those are actually all of the questions that you guys asked. If you've got any other any other questions at all, then drop them down below and I will do my best to help. And again, as I say, if you know anything more about philodendron, uh, philodendron, anthurium, pollination and would like to share that, I would honestly be so grateful. So do let me know down below. But yeah, I will keep you updated on these ones and I will let you know how it goes. If you do come back to my channel looking for updates, I'll probably do updates in either my kind of general plant updates videos or in repot and chats until until the results are kind of finalised. So I will, I'll link them down below whenever I do an update so that you can come back and see what's worked and what hasn't. But yeah, I really hope you enjoyed this video and I really hope that you found it useful. As I say, any questions, drop them below. But if you did enjoy this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, have a lovely day, and I will see you in the next video.